My name is Bill Drummond, his name is Dave Keenan. I'm here to interview him for 40 minutes. It's a pen kiln burn 40 minute interview, number 17. Dave. Um, when you were six years old, what did you want to be? Let me calculate when that would have been. What year, what year, what? So I was six years old in 1977. In 1977, I was living in Shettleston in the east end of Glasgow. Um, I probably wanted to be a paranormal investigator. A paranormal investigator? Like somebody who like tried to find out the reality of UFOs and things like that. I remember, in fact, it, well this is interesting because I remember the, in Christmas in 1977, um, my mother, my mum would tend to like, would make us presents rather than like buy us things. Is that because she was good at making things? Well we both, because we were, we were quite poor, but uh -huh. she was also very talented at arts and crafts. And, and it never really occurred to me that you had, you, you, that Christmas presents were bought in shops. They were things that your mum made. Mm -hmm. And I always remember, what, well, on a slight tangent, I remember the most stunning thing my mum ever made for me, which really um, still is like a little dreamland place. And she built me what she called a diorama. The word diorama is very romantic to me now. She built me a diorama. I remember coming down in the morning on Christmas, uh, on Christmas Day and uh, my dad told me Santa's been. And they opened, the, there was a little curtain over the, 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 the living room and they opened the curtain. And in the middle of this table, there was this diorama. Santa had created this <laughs> landscape, this world. And what it was, was it was a large uh, piece of uh, uh, plywood that she'd painted. There was a circling road around it. The road ran through a tunnel made out of um, cereal boxes that she then painted. And she put paper mache around it and there was a little lake in the middle. It was the most incredible. A little wake. A lake. A, a lake. lake. Which she painted, which she had, she used a silver foil, so the lake would kind of reflect a little bit. It was jaw-droppingly beautiful. Um, but then I kind of became obsessed by aliens, and I think perhaps it was to do with um, television at that time. Nineteen seventies television was very, very strange. The combination of that and also, you know, the three-day week and um, the power cuts. Yep. So we were living in darkness a lot, and I can't really associate that as something quite cosy and fun. So we, I always remember the gas burner that we had, yeah, the yeah. lights we got, we'd put the candles on um, and well, we'd talk about like UFOs and ghosts. And I became very interested in that. So my mum, getting to your, your uh, question, for Christmas 77 when I was six years old, my mum made me an investigator's kit. And it was a cardboard <laughs> box that she painted black with a handle on it. And inside the box there was a notepad, a pencil, a test tube, a magnifying glass and I saw my future in that. I thought my future is going to be, I'm going to be investigating the paranormal. Fine. I'm going to fast forward now. 16. Same question, but 16. 16, I was on the cusp. If, if you'd asked me 17, I would have been much more confidently able to tell you all. Okay, okay, okay. 17. But no, but I'm yeah. going to tell you 16 okay, because okay. I think it's actually quite interesting. The so now, hang on, hang on. So, so, so we're now uh, 87. 87. Okay. 87 is the cusp. So, actually, okay, I'll tell you what happens in 87 and what transforms me and what I want. Probably by early 87, I probably wanted to be an astronomer. I still probably, one of my, one of my things I think that if I am born again or I get the chance to do my life over again and I get my, the chance to do it with free will, I would probably choose to be an astronomer. I think it's an incredibly romantic thing to be. And I was, as a kid, my hero was probably Patrick Moore. I loved Patrick Moore and I was a member of the local astronomy club. But what happened in early 87 at that age was I began discovering, um, because I, I was into comics, that goes hand in hand with astronomy, science mm -hmm. fiction, I was a big course, science yeah, fiction yeah. fan. I liked heavy metal, it was probably the music I liked the most. And what I liked about comics was the sort of DIY thing, the, the, you know, that people would print up their own comics. Yeah. And I began buying like more sort of local DIY comics. And then I began noticing in the same store, these things called fanzines. First science fiction mm -hmm. fanzines, which I love, but then fanzines about music. And I was only into mainstream music at that point, and then I realised there's a whole substrata of strange underground music where people do things themselves, where they make magazines themselves, and where they write about the music. And it was incredibly exciting. I began buying these uh, fanzines without even knowing about the music. So I was reading about the music and imagining it in my head, and it seemed incredible. And a lot of that music was happening in Glasgow. At this point, I've moved to Airdrie. In the 80s, I'm living in Airdrie. Mm -hmm. We're close to Glasgow, but Glasgow again seemed like, um, it may as well have been London. It was yeah. impossibly romantic and exciting, and the feel of going into Glasgow on the train was, well, it was sexual. I mean, you felt like masturbating in the carriage. You were so excited to get to Glasgow. And so, 
I started buying the fanzines and I went, I read about a group called uh, The Pastels at that point mm -hmm. and I thought I've got to go and see this and I went to a, a venue called Fury Murray's in Glasgow. My father took me, I didn't really have any, I had no friends who were getting into underground music so my dad dropped me off there, I wasn't old enough to get in. So hang on, so from metal to the pastels, I mean they're about as far apart as you can get. Well to me, but what metal introduced me to DIY, metal okay. introduced me to science fiction, to fanzines and also I don't think it's that far apart because my what I was pursuing was an extreme sound. Okay. And in mainstream, only metal seemed to have that. But then I realised there was this DIY music, which was kind of post-punk, which mm -hmm. was even more extreme, you know? Okay. Which cut to the chase, which cut off the, the terrible, the crappy lyrics and the spandex and the posturing and cut to the wild guitar parts. So I leapt right into that. My father took me, I wasn't old enough to get in because as you say I was 16 years old and the guy, I remember the guy asked me for ID and I took out my uh, um, national insurance card as if that proves anything. And the guy just said, oh okay, and let me in. And so I was in the venue, saw the pastels, everyone looked like they were in the Ramones, I'd never seen anyone dress like it, they had bow cuts and like uh, little leather jackets that were too small for them. The music was so primitive and DIY, it was as if they couldn't really play, the energy was absolutely incredible and I remember going home that night and standing in front of the mirror and messing, because I was quite, a, I was a very neat uh, boy at that point, mm -hmm. and messing my hair in the mirror and thinking, that's that, I'm never going to comb my hair again. Okay, fast forward again, 26. You're a man. This becomes more, this becomes more difficult, so let, let's, let's work it. So it's and this is the last of these type of questions. Okay, that's fine. You don't have to be thinking, well, he's going to ask me 46 and 36 and, you know. 97, okay, I wanted to be a writer and I was very involved in music writing because to me, um, I was in love with that classic era of rock writing, whether it was Lester Bangs, Richard Meltzer, Nick Toshi's Cream magazine in the US. I also loved that great era of the NME when you had people like uh, Paul Morley and Ian Penman and Danny Baker and things like that, where to me, that was what the most avant-garde and exciting writing was at that time. It was more challenging because the one they were trying to write about something which was essentially nebulous, so you had to invent your own vocabulary. But they didn't even write about the music. They wrote pieces that stood with the music. So they wrote pieces that didn't betray the music. I was in love with the language. I ended up playing in groups, but all I wanted to do was be a rock writer. So people always say that, um, yeah, the rock writers were frustrated musicians, but I ended up being a musician who was a frustrated rock writer. Excellent. That's, that's, that's... Okay, now I've, got to I've got to check my notes now for my next question here. <laughs> Uh, you've, you've almost, you've almost answered, like that was, question five here, is your first, is this your first novel? They, oh, they, they, this is the novel, uh, this is Memorial Dance by Dave Keenan here, Memorial okay? Device. Memorial Dance is a great idea though, <laughs> it's a kind of ritualistic <laughs> remembering. <laughs> At least I didn't say this is soul. <laughs> yeah. This is Memorial Device. It's your first novel, yeah? It is, yes. But you've written uh, uh, fiction before? Short, short stories? I've written a lot of fiction, unpublished fiction. Yeah. I, I spent 10 years uh, writing books without uh, without approaching anyone and without anyone else reading it. Um, because, um, well for a start, I wanted to get to a point where I felt confident with my own writing. So what I did, I set myself a ritual. Um, I decided what I would do is, I would write a novel and I would spend, I would commit myself to, to writing it for two years uh -huh. and then I would destroy the novel. So, that's what happened. I spent two years, I finished the novel off, and I destroyed it, and I started again. When? How old? Well, this is, well, I think when I started doing fiction, I was in my 30s. Uh -huh. This is when I, when I developed the ability, to, perhaps, to write in a much uh, longer term thing. You know, I was able to spend years working on something. You know, because I was on, I was very much on a treadmill of rock writing where, I, where you were writing things by the month, and blah, blah, and blah. And did you go back, you know, you, you mentioned the classic, uh, uh, Writers, pop uh, writers of rock music. Mm -hmm. From that, did you go back to fear and loathing and that kind of stuff that was almost this kind of stuff that was inf informed a lot of those, uh, no. those writers? No, I didn't. I, I'm not a huge fan of like Hunt Race Thompson or the Gonzo uh, journalism so much. Okay, okay. I was a fan of the rock writing. Um, to me, rock writing, a lot of the innovations of rock writing came out of things more than even like science fiction, where you have to like come up, you have to name things that don't really exist. You have to like define something that's nebulous. Yeah. I think you turn to science fiction more than you turn to any of these things, you know? So name one science fiction author then that was, that was a thing for you. 
Um, or was it just more of the kind no, of... No, I, 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 I will name one. I mean, I wasn't so much into the sort of modern uh, writers. I liked the, the, the classic era, Arthur C. Clarke. Okay. To me, Rendezvous with Rama is, is the greatest science fiction book, and there's something in his visioning of scale and size and being able to describe something that was completely alien, that was mind-blowing to me. And to me, that was me trying to describe my experience with post-punk music. Something that was completely alien and on that earth-shaking scale. Okay, I'm going to get back to the questions here. Uh, this is an obvious one to ask. It's not really, but it's a general. Do books still matter? Well, absolutely. I mean, what do you mean? Does a physical book matter, or what we write in books matter? The fact, the fact that that now we live in a world that's very interactive. That is that is what we now expect. We don't expect. You know, the writer is the man behind the pulpit. The writer is. You know, it's it's one it's one vision, it's one person, and you, us, the readers, are the people bowing down. Uh, I don't think you need to bow down, but I still think that the vision of the individual, which is your only real thing you have to go on and your only experience, is still absolutely vital. And I think if we're talking about interacting, the long term, the big project, the massive insight that a novel is. Is, is something that works not just for the readers but for the writer themselves and it is interactive because you're really delving really deep into the, into the reality of what the human psyche is and what possibilities there are and also I'm quite traditional because I believe in stories I totally believe in stories and we all tell ourselves stories and stories are so vital and it's all fiction even the idea of the personality is, is a fictional creation to some many ways so we're all dealing with fiction and we're all dealing with stories and I don't see how we can ever lose that Okay, I'm asking that question, hoping you're going to say that because I need, I need reassurance some of the time because I spend so much of my time writing, and I'm thinking, what's this about? You know, this is just about, you know. And I know, I know you go, you go on uh, an online thing, and it's all about interaction. It's mm. all about, uh, and that's that's the way people are communicating with each other, or responding, or. Or whether it's they go on, you know, they read a piece on the newspaper and it's all about the, the, the comments underneath. Mm -hmm. But when you write a book, it is just a book. Yeah, and, and, and it's a slower experience. You spend a lot of time immersed in this single world. Do yeah. you think it's a great thing to do? Okay, next question. Okay, this is uh, a, a small thing that I've wondered about, and you you use both of these words in the book with your different different voices. What is the number one in Scottish in Scots? What do you mean? It can be ain, as in Wayne, Wayne's, wee ones. It can be wan, as in W A N. It can be yin, as in Y I N. We seem to have at least three words for the numbers, for the number one. Well, because we're very lucky in Scotland that we have all those different ones. And one of the things which I would I hope to do in the book, and this goes on to an interesting thing as well, is the multiplicity of different voices and different ways of approaching it. Because in some of the some of the characters speak in dialogue, and some of them don't. Oh, absolutely. And one of the most important things for me is to say that. You know, you can't reduce Scottishness to a sort of cliche of Scottishness. Oh, yeah. We don't all speak in this ridiculous dialect. I mean, okay, I have an accent. That's maybe the most defining thing about Scotland, but there are so many different aspects of language. Even in a small place like Lanarkshire, you know, you move, you go to Green Gears, even. You go to Caldercrooch, you will notice those slight gradations of um, accent and also of language. So I think it was important for me to say that Scotland is not represented by Scottish dialect alone. That's not a way to do it. In fact, sometimes it irritates me because it's very easy to occupy a sort of I am a cliched Scots guy, and I can play that role very easy by adopting a much broader accent than mm -hmm. maybe I would normally have, and bringing in a lot of um, uh, slang words. So it's important for me to show that the multiplicity, the, all the differences in language, the differences in the use of words, and the differences in the use of even a slang and things like that. So yeah, I think there are countless different words for one. And you know what? There's more being invented all the time, because Scottish is such an alive language, I always compare it to um, uh, the Jews. I think in outside of uh, the Jews, I think the Scots, maybe that's a weird leap, but I think are in love with language as much as Judaism is. I think Scottish is like a sort of a working class Kabbalah 
where they're always they're turning the letters, they're in reinventing the words, they're close to this revelation of God that would just if they could only just twist the language a little bit more, we're going to have this massive breakthrough. Look, you've, you've hit on something here which I wasn't expecting, all right? <laughs> the Jewish thing, all right? Are you bringing that up on purpose with me? No, not deliberately, but it's something that lies very much behind my own interests. Okay, and why, why, why for you? Well, for language, for a start. I think if you're a writer and you're interested in language, I, I can't see why you would not be interested in Judaism, especially Kabbalah, because Kabbalah is the, is the alchemy of the word. Uh huh. What you know? How do we get through the word? And I think in terms of Judaism and Kabbalah, um, the word becomes this. Look. We're talking about numbers. You asked me about the number one. Let's leap on to the number three in terms of this discussion. Because I think the word becomes this sort of interface between the, your experience of yourself and your experience of what we might call reality. But the only way we can approach reality is through an interface of something else. Whether it's the word, whether people say it's come to the Father through Jesus the Son, whether the Sufis say that, that we, the Sufis have a thing where they have a heart meditation, where there's a little space the heart, the Sufis find the heart, and I'm jumping to Sufism at this point, but there's a commonality. Yeah. Sufis find the heart at the point here, just at the side of the ribs. And there's a Sufi meditation where it says, I turn my mind to the heart centre, and my heart centre turns its mind to the divine essence. And these are all these things where we in, there's an interface to get through. And Judaism is obsessed by language as the interface. We keep turning the words, turning the words, and at some point we have a breakthrough and experience of what they would term God. And we talked about what books function as. Again, we turn the word, we turn the word, and we try to move towards some kind of experience through the words. And I think great writing comes when the words become transparent. Okay, I want. I do want to get back to your book here. So I don't want to go off on too much, but I could, you know. You're, you're, yeah, you're, I'm feeling but that. There's two things I've got to say before I, I get back to the book, okay. okay? This week, the main thing I'm having to pull together, edit, and, and is a book called Ireland versus Israel. Wow. So I'm very, very, right now, I am very, very uh, involved in Judaism, mm -hmm. Israel, the state of, mm -hmm. Ireland, the north of, and all sorts of things. So that's one thing mm -hmm. that I'm pulling together. You said three. I've just got, I've just got off the bus. The thing that I'm writing today it's called God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Oh, shit. <laughs> so when you said three, that is something I'm working on. I mean, I don't even reference, you know, w w what that's referencing. Wow. It's just three parts. I'm writing these three parts. Well, that's great. And they're all, all related. But the Irish thing turns in, and if you, the memorial device has a whole oh, thing that comes, from, that comes from Belfast and Ireland look, as well, look, of course. Look, look, look. We will save that until after this because it's not about the not about your book. Okay. Obviously, okay. I'm aware of the loft in your book and things like that. The loft. I'm glad okay. You are. All right. The loft's supposed to be secret. It's a secret <laughs> annex. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me get back to. I'm trying to get. All right. Okay. Now, your use or your lack of use of the inverted comma is throughout the book, so it doesn't matter. What the character is that you that who is who's the first person in each, but you've made a decision to and, and I am I'm, I'm aware that certain writers have made that decision to not use especially in the past twenty odd years to not use the inverted comma. But it, in each each of the chapters, if you can call them chapters, and with you know a different voice, yeah, a different person, yeah. and. You're using all sorts of like you. You talked about about uh, there's one chapter that's all in Scots, you know, completely. Robert uh, Mulligan, yeah. Steel Teeth. So yeah. totally in Scots, and then there's another. It, it's all got different voices, but you keep to that that thing, which is obviously particular to you as a writer, and not to them as characters. Even though you've uh, you've implied that you've asked those each of the not you. The fictional, the fictional oh, author yeah, yeah. has asked each of these people to write their pieces. Mm -hmm. Well, not always write, sometimes speak. I know. And, and okay, this. Do you want to respond to the uh, the quotation mark? Thing? Yeah. Is is that personal thing that you at a certain point in your life decided? You know what? I'm not going to use any very commas anymore. No, it's definitely not as conscious as that. Definitely not. In fact, when you say it, it kind of maybe it makes me a little bit aware of it for the first time. But um, I think in very commas imply a sort of distancing. 
Okay. Which doesn't really appeal to me and doesn't work for these characters in any way whatsoever. Um, because I, I wanted it to have this, the, the feel of genuine uh, personal revelation. And I think quotation marks immediately are going to... You've distanced it again. We go back to the thing where I wanted the text to be transparent. If you want transparent text and transparent writing, and very commons are not going to help that. They're another layer of scaffolding away from transparency, I believe. Okay, I will have to go away and struggle with that myself <laughs> in, what I, in my writing, okay? You use a lot of inverted commas? I, str I, I sometimes, I always end up putting them back in. But you know what I hate? Do you know, I guess you know what it makes me think of? You know when people say something and they say they do that? Yeah. I fucking hate that. And maybe, maybe I, that developed a phobia from inverted commas from people saying, saying something and then doing this. I mean, I knew, you see, when I, when I was young, when I was at school, we were taught to always use the double ones. Yeah. And then as I became an adult, yeah. I became aware, oh no, there's this, you know, it's the single ones, yeah. oh, the double ones, and in this situation, you use this and you're that. Uh -huh. So... You're better just forgetting about it. Okay. Oh. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll forget worrying about it, or just forget using them? Probably forget worrying about it, it's the easiest. Okay, okay I'll try and forget worrying about it. <laughs> I'll just end up worrying about something else. Okay, now I'm going to move on now. Okay. Did you at any time because because some of some of the some of the some of the chapters it's like they're just talking they're just mm. they're, it's not like the fictional writers asked them to go away and write it and they've written it and they've handed it in the paper it's like they're genuinely talking but did you do that almost like that? did you almost just record it no never always so you're writing. always writing always writing even though it sounds like they're just babbling on well you know, sometimes I might, on, I might but, you know. I might talk under my breath while I'm writing. And I also read back for rhythm. Rhythm's the most important thing. Yeah. Capturing, I think the best way to capture a, someone's personality is if you can define the rhythm. And the rhythm is how they even move, how they talk, how they hold themselves. And so often I would, first you write to discover what they're actually writing. So I'd write a bit without any preconception. I'd imagine, who is this? What's their situation? They start talking. Yeah. Again and again and again. Then you start discovering the rhythm. Then perhaps I start talking under my breath a little bit. And I'm talking back as I'm going, so I'm starting to feel the rhythm a little bit more. But I would never, ever uh, transcribe, because I think it's the rhythm of the words, perhaps. And I, I think it would be like, then you become like a ventriloquist or something, somehow. Yeah. You know? It then would seem like, I don't know, some kind of like, show. Or some impersonation, perhaps. At that level. Yeah. You know, where you're, where, whereas you're really you're trying to get a little bit deeper into the, 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 the deep rhythms that express the personality. Rhythm is so important, I think. Okay, I'm going to push on now because I want to. I want to get to the the main thing. That I want to. Okay, I want let's to do it. Yeah. Um, all the characters. I, I love the way that you don't really know, and you start reading the new uh, the, the the next chapter, and you don't really know when this has been written. I mean, some of them you yes. do, and I like that. So that sometimes it's like it could be 1978, yes. or it could be almost ten years later, mm -hmm. looking, or even later than that, looking back, and it's jumping around. And um, and is that part for us, the reader, to, to discover, to try and work out? So, so when's this being written? When, at what point? I don't think you need. I, I don't. That's something you can do if you fancy. There is things to be unravelled in the book, definitely, and it is possible. I was very. I did work out a whole chronology, so I know that everything works together. And I think that's there for the fun of someone that wants to get deeper and unravel it. And there's also appendixes. If you use the appendices, oh, yeah. you can read the book backwards, which is quite a good idea. If you start at the appendices and read the book backwards, you'll understand chronology in quite a different way. I mean, literally, you're going backwards, yeah, yeah. but also it will actually explain some things if you go the other way. And that's there for the fun of it. So you can interact with the book in different mm -hmm. ways, funnily enough. But um, no, because also I think I try to get that experience where do you ever really experience a moment as a moment and in the moment. The moment seems to have multiple perspectives, even from yourself, and evolves in time and changes in time. And it's hallucinated a little bit. That's why there's, there's, I call it an hallucinated oral history. Because I don't know, really, and I think that's closer to reality. I think it's real because Airdrie's weird. The times were weird. People's memories are weird. And they, they're constantly growing and evolving and changing. So I wanted to have that aspect where there's, the, there's these events and they're seen from here. They're seen from here, they're seen from here, and then they're seen from outside of here, even. Okay. I'm taking that on now. Okay. I'll go away and we'll live for that. All right. Uh, and probably read the book again. And <laughs> Each of the characters, 
in the book, they're all roughly of the same generation. Uh -huh. I thought that, I thought, well, no, does Lucas's mum, does Lucas's mum got a chapter? Yeah, she does. She does. Now, Remy's father also has a chapter. Oh, yeah, so yeah. I actually wanted, and that just, I, I thought it was key to bring in people from different generations as well. Yeah. Because, you know, people think that when you lived post-punk, it was just you and your punk pals living it. Yeah, yeah. But your mum and dad were living it. Your mum and dad were putting up with you. Yeah. Your grandfather was putting up with you, you know? So you're, you're part of this thing which is much, much bigger. And to me, that adds to the romance of it. When I think back to, the, the, to my discovery of music and post-punk, I don't just think back to... Uh, the bands or going to the gigs. I think of my dad giving me a lift home. I think of my granny being appalled when she heard the name Sex Pistols, you know? <laughs> I think of all these things, you know? So I think it was important to take it a little bit from other people's viewpoints as well if I was going to catch this. Like the yoga teacher. Yeah. I thought, totally. I can't remember his name, but you know, yeah. Like him yeah. and, and watching and seeing this other thing evolve and... Uh-huh. Totally. And that's what I mean. There's all these different perspectives. Um, I think I mentioned to you earlier on that there's a lot about the body in the book. You're mm -hmm. talking about the yoga chapter when they talk about, they do these moves and exercises to kind of trigger organs and to, commu to facilitate communication between the organs. They come up with these yoga stances. And for me, the structure of the book, I like to think is organic, is like a body. And I thought, well, how do you bring a book alive? Well, each chapter must be like an organ that contributes to a body that eventually is able to take on its own life. So then I began to move characters in the background, almost as if they were being filtered down veins, down blood channels, to each organ, to bring it all alive. Now I'm getting more into... I'll go straight to it. This is a bit of a theory of mine, okay? okay? All right. That great pop music, and I'm using the word broadly there, uh -huh, yeah. cover, um, and this maybe goes for across other arts, comes from places that are away from the cultural center. Yes. At any point, at any point in history, it, it comes away because I don't think if you come from, if you grow up in central London and you've got access to the 100 Club, circa the Pistols, or the, you know, if you, it, it, it is only those places at distance. Yes. And in, in, in my head, I'll always go back to my bedroom in Corby, you know, on an estate in Corby, and I, I had my own little bedroom, and somehow that is where the imagination, oh God, yes. that's where things go like that. And, and even if you don't have a record, I didn't have a record player in my room, not, not when I was 13, maybe when I was maybe later, but it, it, I think that's where things can really, oh God, yes. really, you know, evolve, whether, oh. whether it's something you hate, you know, with, um, but, and um, so were you conscious? Is that something that you can see, identify with? Is that something that's fed into this? But I know this is my theory and it's absolutely, my defense. Absolutely. It's my defense from no, coming no. from nowhere. Totally, absolutely. I mean, if you remember the first chapter starts with Ross Draymond is in his bedroom. Yeah. And he's planning yeah, yeah, to interview yeah. somebody in a group and he's looking out the window and he's smoking a cigarette and he's looking at the horizon mm -hmm. and he's imagining that somehow the horizon holds everything that might happen in the future in his life. And you can almost hear the buzz of the city in the background and there's the, the intimation that Glasgow's there, there's intimation that London's there, but we're somewhere else and how, what are we going to create from that? And I think one, as I said earlier on, when I started reading about music, I just had that, again, it was, I didn't have very much money, it was hard to get records, I could listen to the radio sometimes, but I developed a fantasy of what it was like by reading about it rather than really yeah. experience it. I imagined in London, I imagined what was going on in Glasgow. But also I think in a way, what happens in the book and what happened in Airdrie was actually we beat the mainstream post-punk. We were more extreme. We were crazier because it's, and one of the characters says in the book, and it's so true, it's harder to be Iggy Pop in Airdrie than it is to be Iggy Pop. Especially when you've got to sign up on the door, on the door like you say in the Exactly. In the you know, you're queuing up for the door and you've got no top on. You're, you're wearing your mum's fur coat. You've got these wraparound shades, a bit of smeared lipstick and your d tight denims with your <laughs> pickers. And you're standing in the door in Airdrie. It's hard to be Iggy Pop in Airdrie. So in a way, all these characters, these people were living it. They were living it even harder than their rock and roll models. They fell for it harder. They believed in it even. It took more belief. And Iggy Pop didn't come from New York. Yeah. Yeah, Iggy Pop. yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, he, from Michigan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm just throwing yeah, yeah. that in just yeah, yeah. as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah that's and that's that's what bursts yeah. these these really crazy people, these wild characters. And for a while, being an Airdrie, I wanted to reflect that was you would walk down the city centre and you would see there's a character in there called Street Hassle, and mm -hmm. to me he is the archetypal. There's there's a vision of him in the book 
And it, to me, it's, it's, it's a beautiful vision. It sums up the people that blew my mind as a kid. And it feels real. He's walking in the gutter, in Airdrie, in the snow. He has a cut off in his sleeves t-shirt, no jacket, and he's drinking a can of beer with a pair of shades on. I would see characters like that and, and, <laughs> as a kid. And I was in awe. I'd probably be shopping with my mum. I'd be like, my, there goes the future. <laughs> you know? You've, uh, you, it's not that you've answered something there, but you've contradicted something, an assumption, okay, that, mm -hmm. I, I, but, that I've been making, but that's maybe a wrong assumption, okay? Um, now, earlier on in this, you referenced the pastels. Yep. Now, if, if I have, it's, it's sort of a criticism, mm -hmm. a sort of criticism, mm -hmm. not really of the book, but it's a mindset criticism, yep. which I, ha I, I can see in myself. Now, I spent uh, a whole chunk of my 20s living in Liverpool, yep. working with bands there, primarily uh, Echo and the Bunnymen, Tear Up Explodes. Mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't until the enemy or whatever sounds in that down down here in London were writing about those bands mm -hmm. that they were anybody in Liverpool would take any notice of them. Mm -hmm. They would be just oh, you know what are you wasting your time for, Bill? Working with you know it's like what the rubbish. You know, you know of course you know Mac. It's just you know. So it was it, it always needed the validation of London to to give them their their power or their war and so it's something that I became aware of, resented, but understood, struggled with, and then saw happen time and time again. So to go back to a sort of criticism here, you're referencing things in here. You're referencing a lot of things that I'm totally into. Mm. You know, I as a 15, 16 year old when I was first playing the guitar, I got into the whole Delta Blues thing. Whether it's the myth, actually trying to play, all of that. You're referencing Coltrane. Coltrane's a massive thing for me. Massive, yeah. And and uh, uh, and that era of of modern jazz, yeah, you know, totally. it's like a, like a big, big thing for me. Totally. And then you're referencing not, not uh, maybe American garage bands or what we... Yeah, yeah. Could, you know, Chocolate watch bands, yeah, yeah, stuff yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. Yep. Okay. Oh, you know, the, 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 that's all going on. But the only two Scottish things you reference are the associates. Mm -hmm. I think. I may be wrong. I do okay. reference uh, the associates. Because yep, well. you reference, um, what's it called, their hit single. Mm -hmm. uh, and Party Fears 2. Party Fears 2. And I think you reference Joseph K. You might, or maybe you're referencing Joseph reference K. Joseph K. As in the character in... in no, no, I'm in, referencing the post the the yeah, 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 I'm just trying to remember now. But nowhere else... There is more than that, actually. Is there? Fire engines. Oh, sorry. I... Pastels are in there as well. Yeah, there is. There's one okay, station. Okay. There's one station when the guy talks about all the records they buy, and there's a long list of groups, and I think they're all... Some of them are, are made oh, okay. up, and other ones are Glasgow. But, but what's your point? The point is, I'm thinking... Were you instinctively suffering from the same thing that I know I can suffer from? If they're coming from your own backyard, you're not you're not actually giving them the aura. Oh, you're yes. not giving them because if, if if it's guys from the Delta, uh -huh. you know, or if it's Coltrane, you know, that kind of jazz from the, the 50s, early 60s, yeah. it, it's got this real aura. But if it's if it's the guys down the road. But this is know. the this is the point of the book. This is the point of the book. We're now able to look back and see these guys as the heroes in the face of mass incomprehension. No one cared. No one cared. Most of these people, their, their music career was very short-lived. Most of them didn't even make any records and then they disappeared. To me, that's even more profound okay. and moving. But then how? Uh, my sort of thing was Memorial Device. Nobody would give a shit about Memorial Device in Airdrie. That's how it, I, I, I'm making it as an assumption. Maybe here. I'll do now. Because, because uh, uh, you know, un, unless th this is the no, no, unless the enemy down here or whatever was writing about them or Alan McGee had signed them or no, whatever. No, that's not or, true. But it's just not true, Bill. When, when I talk about local heroes, there were cool guys that everyone looked up to who had Coltrane records who were into the first Suicide LP, who yeah, but, 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 yeah, 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 were yeah, facilitators, yeah. and who people looked up to and thought they were cool. So when those guys began making music, people in Airdrie were listening. Okay, they aspired to being in Glasgow, and people in Glasgow aspired to be in London. 
you know. But um, and we looked out of air different influences. And one thing about the west coast of Glasgow is one of the I think the west coast, or sorry, the west coast of Scotland, looks to the east coast of, of America more than it does to London even. So uh -huh. we were looking quite far away in our inspiration, and these people were still heroes in that the music they were turning people onto and their just commitment to living a rock and roll lifestyle on Airdrie. You're right, most people didn't give a shit. That's why they were abused. People would throw bricks from cars at punks in Airdrie. You know what I mean? People would shout abuse at them in the street. It still happens. You know, it happens probably more now. But at least at that time, some people would look and say, wow, that's inspiring. That's living it. It's possible to live like that, even in Airdrie. It's possible to be Iggy Pop. And so what happens with this book is, people like... Uh, Ross Raymond and Johnny McLaughlin, this book happens after the scene has collapsed. So maybe they then, I mean, a lot of people in the book take the piss. Mm -hmm. They're like, fuck Memorial Device. They're like, that guy, Remy Farr, he was in this shitty synth pop duo called Relate. The guy was a joke. No one took him seriously. They could barely even get a gig in Glasgow. Fuck Memorial Device. But as we go further in time and we look back, the people in it realise they went through such a magical moment. And it's so hard to realise that in the moment, and this word moment is used again and again in the book. How do you live inside a moment? How do you preserve a moment? What does the moment mean? And what a lot of the people in this book are coming to realise is that they gave the greatest energy of, the, of their lives, the greatest time of their lives to this, to art and music, and nothing happened after it. But was it still valuable? The enemy never wrote about it. They never even made a fucking record. Somebody threw a brick at them from a car. Was it still worth it? What did they stand up for? The book asks that. And I think that's why the book was written by the people who wrote the book, even though I wrote the book. I think, I think that's basically... No, there's one, other, <laughs> one, there's one last thing. Okay. One last thing. All right. And it's not a challenge. It's not a... It's... it's and you can almost answered it. You were, you were saying you're in a band, really, so you could write about music. Don't, don't. Because Because so much of the bands in the book that you're describing... It's not about music, you know. They're more, they're more attitude type bands, and 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 I can see that from your book, the book that you did about. Not that I've read it, but I'm aware of the book you did about. Um, who's, the, who's the guy? The guy that you know, all that kind of crap. England's head in reverse, cozy, yeah, throwing yeah, all, that, all that yeah, kind yeah. of thing. Uh -huh. Where I'm, you know, I I, I hear cozy, uh, you know, uh, what what uh, what were they called again? Throbbing Gristle. Throbbing Gristle. I'm thinking, you know, where's the tunes? You know, it's that not all about tunes, Bill. No, 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 I know it isn't, but there's that part of me that, that's, that's... I hear you. That, yeah, that's, okay. There's been the devil's advocate when yeah, I'm yeah. listening to them and mm. thinking, where the fuck, where's the tunes? Where's the, where's the you know? I, I, and, and, and so a lot, of, most of the bands that you're describing in there is the, not about the tunes. It's about, it's about an, it is just the attitude. No, I would, I would, I would disagree with that. Um, there's lots of bands that are certainly about the tunes like Clarkston Parks or like a yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, absolutely. blah blah blah. And also I think Memorial... I hate them by the way. What? The yeah. Clarkston Parks? Yes. Why? I hated, I hated anything. I hated the jam. Uh, 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 nothing to do with the jams, just something about the jam. Like more then... than general you mean? No. No, I was no, 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 no. Look, I, I love the small faces, okay? Uh -huh, yeah. I love the, the who from that period. Not who, but, but, okay. uh, but, but uh, anything that's from the jam on, look, this is something else altogether. This is a more but we're get, we're getting, we're getting, Okay, but what is your question? So, there you're asking, no question. I'm it's about an attitude thing. Attitude it's, was very important in terms of liberating people in Airdrie, I think, to be able to change their attitude. But I also think to be able to think what was permissible as music what you could get away with. That was important too, because it made people think, well, you know what? The sounds that I have in my head are maybe translatable in that case. I think that's a big thing. And sense of permission is very, very big. And I think that um, one of the things that is great from literature and art and music is to give you the permission to then find the sound that's you, the rhythm that is you, the expression that is you. And you know what? You might not be a tune. You might be a discord. And that could be exciting too. And you are quite discordant. I don't care if you bang on about tunes. There's a lot of discord in you as well. Look, look I'm throwing that at you. Yeah. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Totally and utterly. Mm -hmm. But I guess there's, there's another part of me that's parallel in there that is about tunes as well, you know. And, and look, I won't go any further. I've got to the end now. It is a brilliant book, you know. And I hate using adjectives. <laughs> but... I wish I didn't think it was so good. It's fantastic. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Much appreciated.